and friends, and, there will, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by my name's sake, but not a hair on your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your soul. Good morning. I've looked forward to this time with you. Caveat that I always start out my messages with is when I find in my life what I need the most, that's what I talk about. So I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to me, okay? That's my caveat. I want to thank everyone who took part. Uh, Casey, it's always wonderful to hear that beautiful, beautiful instrument. And Wanda, thank you for your beautiful prayer this morning. Always moves me. And the, and the praise music, thank you, praise team. Anthony, thank you for reading Scripture. Scripture sounds a little bit like what's going on today, doesn't it? The world's kind of a mess. What are some of the global issues that we're facing? What about global warming? What do you think about that? As a kid growing up, I remember hearing church members say, in the end times, the seasons will change. I saw this week on television, no, it wasn't on television because I don't watch television. <laughs> Someplace I saw a video, record heat wave in China, roads literally buckling under the heat in China. What about supply chain issues around the world? General Motors is sitting on thousands and thousands of vehicles that they can't release because they don't have little computer chips. What about the war in Ukraine? We pray for that every week in our Sabbath school class. It's terrible. People losing lives. One dictator overthrowing a country. What about the last couple of years, the pandemic that we've been through? What about that? Our world is kind of a mess, isn't it? Has it been worse? Yeah, probably. What about national affairs? What are we facing on a national level? What do you think about the riots, the destructive burning and rioting that we had over the George Floyd issue and racism issues. What about record high inflation right now? What about CRT in the classrooms? Stock market? Gender fluidity, the abortion issue? A lot of things going on at a national level. Southern border, or lack thereof. I could go on, okay? What about locally? I've lived in Spokane for 44 years, and I have never seen the number of shootings and stabbings and drive-by shootings that I've seen in the past couple of years. Never seen that here in Spokane. Quiet little old Spokane, where we thought we were kind of insulated from that sort of thing. What about the freeway? Have any of you driven on the freeway lately? <laughs> oh, my word. We only stay in Southern California for three months out of the year because we want to get away from that. And now it's coming here. I was coming home from town yesterday in the middle lane, doing 67. And three cars passed me on the right, doing at least 85, if not 90. Southern California has come to Spokane. People are angry. People are in a hurry. People are anxious. I think the thing that has impressed me the most, frightened me the most, if there is such a thing as frightening me, most of the time I don't live in fear. I try not to, because the Bible tells us many, many, many times not to live in fear. 
But the thing that impressed me the most was how rapidly in 2020 we went from normal to surreal. How quickly our government controlled the people. How quickly that happened, right or wrong. How quickly separation of church and state went when they shut down our churches but left liquor stores open. I'm sorry, right or wrong, I'm not condemning, I'm not complaining, I'm just saying that shocked me. That surprised me. Do these events portend the end is imminent? As a child growing up, I remember my parents talking about the second coming. <laughs> And to be honest, I prayed to God that that wouldn't happen until I could grow up <clears throat> and experience the love and compassion of a beautiful woman. <laughs> and he granted my wish. 46 years. If it wouldn't have been for me, Christ could have come 46 years ago. But And I remember thinking then, and my parents talking, and other people talking in the church then, <gasps> a Roman Catholic was elected as a president. Certainly that's a sign. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the, 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 the Vietnam War, these were things I grew up with. The, the, the Civil Rights Movement, certainly these are signs of the end. The end is very near. That was a, I was a kid. Before then, my parents' generation, World War II came along. That must have been a horrible, horrible time to live through. Not as bad here in the United States, but certainly in Europe and other places around the globe. It was a terrible time. Certainly, certainly Adventists thought then this is a foretaste of the imminent end. And before that, we could go back in time. 150 years we could go back. And what have we as Adventists been talking about? Second coming. Is there anyone here today that doesn't think the end is near? Don't raise your hands. Let me give you just one other little perspective. Whether we want to admit it or not, the end is always near. The end is always near. I'm 66. God said three score and seven. Four more years. None of us know what tomorrow holds. None of us know when our last breath will happen. That's when the end comes. That's when we meet Christ. It's that close for any and all of us. But outside of that perspective... Do we believe that we are in the last days of planet Earth? And do we believe that there are many souls in the mud pit of sin and hopelessness? Yeah, I think so. But here's the question. What to do, what to do. What are we doing about it? Pray with me. Father in heaven, fill this room with your sweet Holy Spirit. Speak through me, I pray, that uh, we can learn something today that gives us a road map, something that we can do if we truly believe we are in the final days of earth's history. And I believe we do. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Take us home. Bless these people, this wonderful congregation, the Spokane Valley Adventist Church, our church family. We love each other. We want to love each other more. We want to love others more. May this message be that catalyst. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wouldn't it be nice, have you ever just wished that an event would occur and somebody had a checklist for you that said, when the pandemic occurs, that's when you lay in six months' worth of food. Or when um, 
this particular crisis happens or when this earthquake ha happens in this place, then that's when you put your affairs in order and perhaps put your home up for sale. Kind of giving you the Adventist perspective of what I grew up with because there was going to come a time, you know, when we're going to have to do those things. Do you wish somebody could just give you a checklist and say, at this time do this and at this time do that? I, I love checklists. I mean, I'm, I'm an accountant. I live by checklists. I love that. It kind of takes the thought process out of it. Wouldn't that be nice to have that? Well, folks, my talk today is not a checklist. Trust me, it's not. Because I don't think one exists. I don't think it's going to exist. I think we have eschatological order of how things will unfold, but I don't think any of us know exactly how that's going to happen. And we certainly don't know when, and we certainly don't have a checklist. That's not what this message is about. This is message is about what do we do right now if we believe that this is the end of planet Earth or that it's very, very imminent. So I did some study, and I think I found some things, I think, that might help us on that journey towards that wonderful and glorious day. About 2,600 years ago, over 2,600 years ago, in Jerusalem, things were a mess. Things were ugly, very similar to what might have been when Franz Ferdinand was assassinated and World War I happened. Does anybody really understand why that created World War I? I don't think I ever will. Or like when the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939 and threw us into the great conflict called World War II, that's what Jerusalem was facing over 2,600 years ago. Babylon was at the door. Jerusalem was under siege. They were about to fall. The southern kingdom of Judah was about to fall. That's what was going on. And then comes along a story in the book of Jeremiah. And for those of you who have an electronic device and want to follow in the Message Bible, I encourage you to do that. If not, just sit back and listen, because indulge me, please. I love the Message Bible because it reads beautifully. It reads understandably. And if there's ever a time when I need to study deeply theological issues, which I don't typically because I'm not a pastor, I would go to a different translation. But this is a beautiful paraphrase. So just listen to this story in Jeremiah 38. And fasten your seatbelts because there's a lot of big names here. Shaphatiah, son of Matan, Gedaliah, son of Pasher, Jehuchal, son of Shelemiah, and Pasher, son of Malchijah, heard that Jeremiah was telling the people, namely, this is God's message. Jeremiah was a prophet of God, okay? Whoever stays in this town will die, will be killed or starved to death, or get sick and die. That's how bad it was in Jerusalem at that time. But those who go over to the Babylonians will save their necks and live. And God's sure word, this city is destined to fall to the army of the king of Babylon. He's going to take it over. These officials told the king, please kill this man. He's got to go. He's ruining the resolve of the soldiers who are still left in the city as well as the people themselves by spreading these words. This man isn't looking after the good of his people. He's trying to ruin us. So King Zedekiah, oh, good old wishy-washy, spineless Zedekiah, I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, paraphrasing the paraphrase. <clears throat> King Zedekiah caved in. He said, if you say so, go ahead, handle it your way. You're too much for me. So they took Jeremiah and threw him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son that was in the courtyard of the palace guard. They lowered him down with ropes. There wasn't any water in the cistern, only mud. And Jeremiah sank into the mud. Any of you ever been stuck in the mud? Literal mud? It's not a fun place to be. Now here comes our hero, somebody who is mentioned only in two chapters in the Bible, very, very briefly. Ebed-Melech. 
Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, a court official assigned to the royal palace, heard that they had thrown Jeremiah into the cistern. While the king was holding court in the Benjamin gate, Ebed Melech went immediately from the palace to the king and said, My master, O king, these men are committing a great crime in what they're doing, throwing Jeremiah the prophet into the cistern and leaving him there to starve. He's as good as dead. There isn't a scrap of bread left in the city. So the king ordered Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, get three men and pull Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. Now, just, just before that, he said, go ahead and throw him in. Now he's saying, well, now get him out. So Ebed Melech got three men, and they went to the palace wardrobe and got some scraps of old clothing, which they tied together and lowered down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, called down to Jeremiah, put these scraps of old clothing under your armpits and around the ropes, Jeremiah did what he said. And so they pulled Jeremiah up out of the cistern by the ropes, but he was still confined in the courtyard of the palace guard. So, what to do, what to do. Jerusalem is under siege, no food, things are ugly. What did Ebek Malik do? He could have gone and hid. He could have gone into seclusion. He could have done many other things, but he became an activist for God's prophet, Jeremiah. He says, this is wrong. We've got to do something. He went to the king, appealed to the king, got the ropes, got some men, and saved Jeremiah's life. I think that's an important lesson for us. When things are really, really, really ugly, maybe that's time we should begin to serve others, to think of others, to think of others' plights. And as I, as I open my comments, do we think that there are a lot of people today right here in our community that are stuck in a mud pit of sin, stuck and don't know how to get out, stuck with hopelessness? And we've got a message yeah, I think there are. And I think Ebed Melech gives us a great example of what we should be doing, helping these people. Let's go a little further. Let's look at Luke 19, verses 11 through 25. Luke 19, 11 through 25. Again, I'm going to read from the Message Bible. <clears throat> And I think this gives us a really, really good roadmap, checklist, if you will. While he had their attention, and because they were getting close to Jerusalem by this time, and expectations were building that God's kingdom would appear any minute, he told this story. Jesus told this story. There was once a man descended from a royal house who needed to make a long trip back to the headquarters to get authorization for his rule and then return. Who do you think he's talking about here? Sound familiar? Jesus comes, sets up his kingdom, goes back to the Father, is, and we're waiting for this long return. But first he called ten servants together, gave them each a sum of money, and instructed them, operate with this until I return. Uh, the King James Version says, occupy until I come. But the citizens there hated him, so they sent a commission with a signed petition to oppose this rule. We don't want this man to rule us. When he came back, when he came back, he did come back, bringing the authorization of his rule victorious. He called those ten servants to whom he had given the money to find out how they had done. The first said, Master, I doubled your money. He said, Good servant, great work. Because you've been trustworthy in this small job, I'm making you governor of ten towns. Second said, Master, I made a 50% profit on your money. He said, I'm putting you in charge of five towns. The next servant said, Master, here's your money, safe and sound. I kept it hidden in the cellar. Tell you the truth, I was a little afraid. I know you have high standards and hate sloppiness and don't suffer fools gladly. <laughs> and the master said, you're right, that I don't suffer fools gladly. And you've acted the fool. Why didn't you at least invest the money in security so I would have gotten a little interest on it? And then he said to those standing there, take the money from him and give it to the servant who doubled my stake. And they said, but master, he already has doubled. He says, that's what I mean. Risk your life 
and get more than you ever dreamed of, play it safe, and end up holding the bag. I think Jesus was telling the people that were listening at that point, this occupy till I come, another way to say it would be do business as usual. He gave them some of his assets and he said do business with them. And what are the assets of Jesus? The teachings, this glorious plan of salvation. Do something with this until I return. So, if there's such a thing as a checklist of what that means, what does it mean to do God's business until, he re until Christ returns? I think the book of Luke, Luke's gospel is a wonderful, wonderful roadmap for that. Chapter 3 of Luke talks about repentance. Remember the voice crying in the wilderness? Repent of your sins and be baptized. I think repentance is a very important thing about being about God's business. Respond to temptation with Scripture. You can't very well respond to temptation with Scripture if you don't know Scripture, right? So I think that's another thing we should be doing to be about God's business. Respond when God says, follow me with discipleship. You know, there's no example in the Bible that I can think of where God called somebody like Matthew or Simon Peter and Andrew said, follow me when they didn't. He said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. I think that's an important step. Chapter 6 in Luke talks about give, forgive, don't judge, love your enemies, build your house on the rock. Do you think that's important in these last days? Chapter 8, fertile soil bears fruit. I think there are many people out there. We tend to think that we're living in an increasingly secular society, and we probably are. But that tells me that there are a lot of people out there that are looking for something, that are desperate for something. There's fertile soil out there, folks. Are we planting? Carry the good news as missionaries. Chapter 9. Chapter 10 is the story of the Good Samaritan. And what's the story of the Good Samaritan all about? Showing compassion. Looking out for others' needs. Restoring dignity, humanity, civility. I could go on. But I think this really sums up what to do, what to do. This is what Jesus asked us to do be about his business the the whole gospel of luke talks about what that looks like i don't know how many of you um, have purchased the uh, adult daily devotional by john bradshaw this year called hope of glory it's a good book it's a very good book we enjoy it each day's reading Today's reading, there was something that really jumped out at me. Kind of says maybe we aren't being about our Father's business. We aren't occupying very well till He comes. Here's what John Bradshaw says. This is John's opinion, and I respect it. Churches strive to have excellent music, while excellent Bible teaching may be unfortunately absent. Pleasing interpretations of scriptures are popular without necessarily being biblical. Popular churches will be full for an hour a week, but Christians are often indistinguishable from non-Christians. Boy, that hit me. Have we lost sight of what it is to do God's business? Has Christianity, by and large, lost sight of what it means to occupy till I come? Do we just come to church once a week and just sit? Or are we about the master's business 
all day, every day. Let's go back to our little friend Ebed Melech in Jeremiah 38. I read it fast, something you may have missed. I certainly did the first time I read it, but I want to reread it, okay? And I want, you to, I want you to pick up on something here that's, you know, the beauty about the Bible is the deeper you, you dig, the more riches you find. I love that about the Bible. So here's, here's a little gem that I think we can dig out of this passage that we might have glossed over had we not have paused to think about it in terms of what to do, what to do, if these truly are the last days. So, starting with verse 11 through verse 12, 10, excuse me, 10 through 12. The king ordered Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian get three men and pull Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies, okay? Ebed-Melech got three men, went to the palace wardrobe, and got some old scraps of clothing, which they tied together and lowered down with the ropes. Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian called down to Jeremiah, put these scraps of old clothing under your armpits and around the ropes. Here's a question. Did Ebed-Melech and his three men, could they have pulled Jeremiah out with just the rope? Yeah, they could have. But here's the little hidden gem. Ebed-Melech had a sense of inner compassion that shows right here. He went and got, took the time to go and find old scraps, rags, if you will, threw those down with the rope and said, Jeremiah, this is going to hurt when we pull you up. If you don't wrap these rags around it, the ropes, and put them under your armpits so that when we tug... It won't tear at your flesh. It's not going to hurt as bad. That is compassion. That is compassion. Above and beyond what he had to do. Was it a big thing? No, the big thing was going and getting the rope and saving Jeremiah. That was the big thing. But what was the little thing that made all the difference? The rags, the rags around the rope, the compassion. Who is the ultimate teacher of compassion? Jesus. How many times do you read the New Testament? And he had compassion on them and healed them or fed them or healed them. <clears throat> excuse me, healed him some more. He had compassion on them. He was the ultimate teacher of compassion. His life was a life of compassion. His very being on this planet was compassion and love for a fallen race. I realize that we're all different. We all have different spiritual gifts. Not everyone's an evangelist like John Bradshaw. Not everyone's an author. Not everyone can do things. To, to, to be honest with you, standing up here and talking to you doesn't scare me, but some of you would rather be in a pit with live snakes than stand up here and talk to people, okay? So I realize we all have, we have different talents, we have different abilities. But we can all have compassion, can't we? And it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to show compassion. And I truly believe, I truly believe, when we ask the question, what should we be doing right now if we truly believe that within the next year or, or months, we've seen how rapidly things can change, that Christ's return is imminent? What should we be doing? And I don't see anything in the Bible that says, flee to the mountain jet and hide. I don't see anything that says, you know, I, I see things that say, be prepared. Be, be knowledgeable of the signs. But let's be about the Father's business. 
was compassion. Now let me, let me just give you a couple of examples from our life, and I'm not saying this to Pat myself or Vicky back, but <clears throat> not long ago we were walking through the parking lot at Home Depot, and we encountered this older couple, and they had three great big bags of soil on their cart, and their trunk was open, and they were just standing there. And I said, oh, can I help you put your bags of dirt in the trunk? <gasps> oh, yes, thank you. We were wondering how we were going to do that. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm no Hercules, but I hefted these bags into their trunk, and Vicky got to talking to him a little bit. Where do you live? Oh, we live in Otis Orchards. Well, so do we. What road do you live on? Linden. Linden? Well, we've got some good friends that live on Linden by the name of Larry and Sonia Johnson. Some of you know them. Oh, Larry and Sonia, they're our next-door neighbors. They're wonderful people. Didn't take much. Just moved some bags of dirt into the trunk. <laughs> we have some neighbors that live kitty-corner. We love our neighbors. We have some neighbors that live <clears throat> kitty-corner from us. He's an outdoor guy. She's an indoor gal. Really, truly. I mean, she comes home from work, opens the garage door, goes in, the garage door goes down, you never see her again. And so he had planted a tomato in a pot that's sitting beside the, the garage door, and he's been gone on vacation to Canada to visit his family. And Vicky looked across there, we're sitting on our little front porch, rocking, in our rocking chairs, as old people do. <clears throat> and she looked across and noticed that the, the tomato plant was wilting. <laughs> she says, we can't have that. So she, she got a bucket of water, watered the tomato plant. Was it a big thing? No. Was it a compassionate thing? I hope so. Are you shy? Are you an introvert? Have you got one of these things in your pocket? I better not take it out. All my cords will fall out. Have you got a cell phone like this? Can you text? Can you call someone with a word of encouragement? How about write cards? Write a card to somebody. Vicki and I did that <clears throat> for a year. And we were amazed at how many people said that card came just at the right moment. Gave us an opportunity to think about them, pray for them. Can we treat everybody kindly with a smile? By the way, kindness and compassion are fruits of the Spirit, you know. And we pray for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Can we do that? I think Luke 19 really gives us a good idea that we should be about the Father's business. I think the gospel, all four of the gospels, and then all of Paul's writing give us a good idea of what it means to be about the Father's business. Ebed Melik gives us an amazing example, compassion. His act shines as a candle on a dark night. His act restored dignity, humanity, civility in a world gone mad. And what's truly interesting about the story of Ebed Melech is just a chapter later, Jeremiah gets to turn around and return the favor and saves his life. It's an interesting read. What to do, what to do in these last days. Be about the Father's business. Be about his business. Show compassion. Show kindness. It's a wacky world out there. It's an ugly world out there in many ways. And there are many people that are good people. There are many people in this church that are Ebed Meleks. As I look across the crowd today, I see people with great compassion. I thank you for that. Church thanks you for that. I have a confession. I still subscribe to the Spokesman Review. I'm sorry. I've been a practicing CPA in this town for 44 years, and, and I kind of feel like I kind of need to watch the legal notices, you know, in case somebody wants to sue me or something. Or in case one of my clients gets sued. Kind of like to watch the 
obituaries in case one of my clients passes and I don't not immediately alerted of this, which I've seen from time to time. And of course I subscribe for the funnies. Got to read the funnies every day. I was reading the spokesman review here a couple of weeks ago. And I came to the obituary section and I don't know what drew me to this because period I don't read obituaries, I look at names primarily. But something about this obituary jumped out at me. Maybe it was the look on this woman's face. She had a glow about her in this picture. Her name is Sharon. And I read it, and I read it out loud to Vicki, and it brought tears to my eyes. And you already know I'm a blubberer, so I'm a blubber here, but bear with me. This is important that we hear this. Her name is Sharon. She was the perfect balance of kind and courageous, faithful and funny, steadfast and spicy. Spicy, I like that. Adventurous, empathetic, loving and tender. She was a leader and always led with compassion. She loved her family fiercely and would do anything for her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Sharon was the definition of charity and spent her life serving others. Her car rarely lived in the garage. Instead, it lived on the road to serve, taking meals, giving rides, comforting, listening, cheering up, and cheering on. There wasn't a person she wouldn't talk to. She didn't have acquaintances. Everyone who met her was her friend, and she cared deeply for them. But here's what really got me in the end. It goes on to talk about her family and so forth. In lieu of flowers, please serve someone today. Help someone in need. Make a new friend. Make our world a better place. Sharon was not a member of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. But I would hope that when our time comes, if Christ hasn't returned yet, that that could be written about every one of us. And so today, I challenge you to be an Ebed Melech, to be a Sharon. We had a Sharon in our church she went by the name of Joyce. When Joyce passed, I made a vow that I would try to carry on her legacy of compassion and hospitality. And so I ask today, from those of you out there, can I get one of you, one of you, to make a commitment to be an Ebed Melech, to be a Sharon, to be a Joyce? Can I get five of you? If we had ten people in this congregation that an obituary could be written like Sharon, we could change the world. We could change this community. We could change the dynamics of this church. Occupy till I come. Be about the Father's business. That's what we should be doing. We should be doing it every day, every chance, all the time. Pray with me. Father, we anxiously await Christ's return. We've maybe grown just a little bit complacent. We're maybe not doing Father's business as he's asked us to do. Help us to be people of compassion, to be disciples who are willing to put themselves out to pull people out of the mud pit. We just pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit 
and that that would be evident by the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And in so doing, change our community, change our relevance in our community, change the dynamics in our church, come alive with love and compassion. That's how they'll know we're Christians. Thank you for the opportunity to be about your business. And I just ask a special blessing on each and every one here today and that everyone whose heart is touched would make a vow to be filled with compassion as Christ taught us so beautifully when he lived on this earth. Thank you for the Sabbath day of rest. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. I've enjoyed my time with you. Have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath. Thank you.